Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here, and thank you to Sean Ming and the Center for Urban and Global Studies for inviting me to be part of this World Lecture Series. What I'm going to do today is to present some material from the book I have just finished, which approaches <coughs> cities and other plots of land in terms of the roles that they played in the geographical imaginations of the 9th through the 11th centuries. Uh, by this, I mean how people thought about cities, imagined them mentally, and translated those mental images into written texts, an exercise that was actually undertaken quite frequently in this period, perhaps because of the highly mobile nature of the society in which the exigencies of climate or the demands of trade, scholarship, and pilgrimage took people very far from their homes many times in their lifetimes. Today I'm going to focus on one aspect in particular of the city imagined, the built environment. The title of this talk is taken from the title of a well-known book by Kevin Lynch, which is called The Image of the City, originally published in 1960. Lynch argued that understanding what he called the quote-unquote legibility of American cities would help urban planners design functionally and aesthetically successful cities. Central to legibility is the visual and the mental, how the look of the city imprinted itself on the minds of its inhabitants. So here's Lynch on his book, in the, this is in the introduction. Uh, this book will consider the visual quality of the American city by studying the mental image of that city which is held by its citizens. It will concentrate especially on one particular visual quality, the apparent clarity or legibility of the cityscape. By this we mean the ease with which its parts can be recognized and can be organized into a coherent pattern. Just as this printed page, if it is legible, can be visually grasped as a related pattern of recognizable symbols, so a legible city would be one whose districts or landmarks or pathways are easily identifiable and are easily grouped into an overall pattern. Lynch's sources were interviews with people who lived in the cities of Boston, Jersey City, and Los Angeles about how they saw and thought of their cities, how they saw and thought about its districts, landmarks, or pathways. Thus, he focused on the lived experience of those cities and the mental image formed by that lived experience. I, on the other hand, am not focused on the lived, or I'm not only focused on the lived experience of early Islamic cities, but on the mental image of those cities as represented in writing. Now, that mental image might come from the lived experience of those cities, but it might not, as we shall see. Written descriptions of the urban built environment engage the visual imagination of an audience and stimulate, ideally, the recognition of that which is being described as a cityscape. In other words, these descriptions help register the cityness, what we might think of as the cityness, of the mental image conjured by the text and differentiate from it from other kinds of landscapes represented in other texts. This does not mean, again, that the authors that I'm going to examine here had necessarily seen the cities they were describing with their own eyes, although some of them had, but that they were describing the cities in terms of what could be seen and what could be expected to be seen, i.e. the architecture and location of structures in the built environment. Moreover, although Lynch does not follow this analogy any further in his book, the connection between recognizing a legible city and being able to read the words on this page lends itself perfectly to my analysis. That is, in the text that I examine, cities were actually written and read. And if they were legible, it means that they were comprehensible in terms of their written representation, and thus could have been compelling or useful for people whether or not they had experienced or seen the city on the ground. In the examples that follow, I'll show how descriptions of urban structures that could claim particular religious or political significance in terms of their great size, lavish adornment, powerful patrons, or ritual function, what, what, what Lynch would call landmarks, were illegible and therefore potent means of communicating the authority of their founders, owners, or stewards as well as the status of the city in which they were located as a privileged destination for pilgrimage or residence. In other words, representing the urban built environment in text was a powerful way of pledging loyalty or claiming belonging, but only if it was done in a way that would be accessible, comprehensible, and authoritative to an audience, an audience who themselves were well versed in cities, both on the ground and in the imagination. Well, I'm going to focus mainly on written descriptions of structures in Mecca, Jerusalem, and Baghdad, let me start. Here's, here's my map. I'll go back to it. Let me start 
with a rare iconographic representation of a city from the 9th through the 11th century Islamic world. Rare meaning I've only found in all of my research two graphic uh, representations of cities um, in the manuscripts that I've looked at. Uh, there's a third on the walls of the Great Mosque of Damascus, but uh, it's con it, it needs to be contextualized in a very different way than these ones do, so I don't count it. Okay. So, this is a rare iconographic representation of a city from the 9th through the 11th century Islamic world. This city is in Bahadiyya, uh, which is the first capital of the North African Fatimid Caliphate from an anonymous 11th century world geography. And then Bahadiyya is located in what is today Tunis. This manuscript page would have been like this, i.e. this would have been the top of the manuscript. And so the, um, this depiction would have been oriented uh, uh, would have been oriented, um, but, let's see, eastward. But I've changed it so it's oriented north. This is the Mediterranean Sea. This city is on the North African coast. And so you can see the way the writing is, well, maybe you can't tell, but the writing is meant to be read this way. And in fact, this caption is upside down, uh, given the way I've oriented it. But I wanted you to see the way it looked out onto the Mediterranean Sea. As you can see here, the space within the walls of the city is taken up primarily by oversized, ornate, and colorful structures labeled, and this is the caption that's upside down right uh, here, palaces of the imams, peace be upon them. As an actual iconographic depiction rather than written description, this cityscape is particularly visually compelling, and its caption ensures that the link it makes between the city and the power and prosperity of the Fatimid rivals to the Abbasid Caliphate those of you who are taking my classes know what I mean. This is all uh, 10th century rivalry between North Africa and Baghdad, as well as to their legitimacy as infallible imams in the Ismaili Shiite tradition cannot be misunderstood. This is what I mean when I say that describing or depicting monumental or landmark architecture was a legible and therefore effective means of establishing cities as categories of belonging that depended on, even promoted, certain notions of political and religious authority. Mecca. This is a modern day picture just to give you a sense of what Mecca looks like from the air. The earliest systematic description of Mecca's built environment, which would have looked very different in the 9th century than this, <laughs> and one of the earliest descriptions of an urban built environment anywhere in the Islamic world comes to us from a 9th century topographical history by a Muslim scholar and Meccan res resident writing in Arabic named al Ezraki. As the famous historian of Islamic art and architecture, Oleg Grabar, who has sadly very recently passed away, has noted, this work is an astounding collection of information about not only Mecca's changing built environment, but also about the ways in which people thought about urban space, architecture, and construction in the 9th century. Moreover, Grabar indicates that this text, this 9th century text, provides a number of passages that, in his words, quote, answer a question about some aspect of the built environment, the kinds of questions that might occur to you if you were visiting the city on pilgrimage. And of course, Mecca is the destination, that's what you see here, of the Hajj, the yearly uh, pilgrimage that Muslims are expected to undertake once in their lifetime if they are able. Um, however, if one did not what, know already what to do on the Hajj, one would not find the answer, or at least a clear systematic answer in El Ezraki's book. This suggests to me that El Ezraki did not intend to produce a pilgrimage guide per se, perhaps because he didn't see the need as pilgrims already knew what to do or got their information elsewhere. However, I would argue that El Ezraki's real goal in authoring this work was not to facilitate the Hajj, but rather to bear witness to the ongoing recognition and commemoration of sacred history uniquely possible for insiders in Mecca, those who belonged in the city who paced and peered at its built environment on a day-to-day -day basis. The first third of the work is devoted to a foundation narrative, a history of the city of Mecca, which actually focuses on the central ritual structure, the Kaaba, or the cute black cubic structure in the middle of uh, the sanctuary. Uh, this begins, uh, and then after the foundation narrative, the, the work uh, changes from a chronological to a spatial organization. Uh, beginning with the Kaaba here, and then radiating outward um, uh, to describe the surrounding sanctuary, which would be this area here, and then the city a little bit further, and then concluding 
with a brief enumeration of the mountains